Christopher Cortman. I'm Tom Kelly. We're going to be with you for the next hour talking about all sorts of different things that we can do to make our minds stronger. Uh, you know, Dr. Cortman, we haven't talked about this, but there are a number of different applications and uh, games and so forth that are really good for helping to build up a person's mind. The one I've kind of become addicted to the last couple of months is this Wardle game. Do you play Wardle? You know, I've played it with my 14-year-old before. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I do it every day. Well, that's not true. I'm, 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 I do it five out of seven days, I remember. Uh, I, I tend to forget once or twice. But, you know, I try to do it every day. And out of the first 40 that I've done, I missed two. I didn't get two of them in the requisite six tries. Wow. Um, but, you know, you're a lot smarter than the guys I hang out with. So <laughs> just know that I'm out of my league here. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a lot of fun. And I've got a little system, and it seems to work for me. My, my wife thinks my system is silly, but it works for me. I use I start with the same word every time. And then if that doesn't get me far enough along, then I have a second word. And then that kind of gets me moving along. You know, it's hard to argue with success. Yeah. 38 out of 40 is an excellent score, no matter how you slice it up, unless you're like an air traffic controller. Or yeah. yeah that, that. But um, that's that's impressive. So, you know, the old adage is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Well, it, you ever, do you ever watch Wheel of Fortune? I have. I've seen it before, yeah. Okay. So, you know, they at the end, they give them R-S-T-L-N-E. Okay. Okay. So that it, because everybody you know wants to use those letters because those are the letters used most in the English alphabet. So when playing Wordle, I always start with the you know use five letter words. I always start with the word learn, L E A R N, mm. which covers most of. The, so from there, I'm able to get a pretty good idea as to you know where to go from there. If that doesn't work, if it comes up empty, then my word is shout, S-H-O-U-T. Mm -hmm. Between those two words, I probably have, you know, all, all the letters where I need them. And if I don't have any uh, vowels at that point, well, then I know the I and Y are in play. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, give, it gives me a pretty good uh, start out, those two. Um, so that... I think those kinds of things are good and healthy for us and certainly better than playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons World of Death and Destruction <laughs> 2 or whatever it is that, uh, that most of our teenagers are out there playing. Well, just the idea of keeping your mind sharp is a good thing. We have research that says there's probably seven things to be aware of if you want to stave off um, dementia, including the most common form is uh, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease. Right. And one of those seven things is um, an active mind. And so as much as possible, you want to have an active mind. Another one is an active body. And so between exercising your mind and exercising your body, you do great things to potentially stave off some of those horrible uh, diseases at the end of life, like dementia. Yeah, well, I'm, and I think everybody would like to stay, stay off dementia as long as possible. Yeah. And not only that, most everybody would like to stay off dementia as long as possible. I don't know where I've heard that before, but yeah. it rings a bell. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my mom, my mom, who is uh, in her 80s, uh, said to me the other day, she said, roses are red, violets are blue. I might have Alzheimer's, but at least I don't have Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that well, was pretty good. <laughs> I don't know how bad she has it, but we'll have to tell stories to see whose mother has a greater <laughs> do dose of dementia someday. No, my mom's sharp as a tack, and, and when she isn't you know she has a momentary lapse of memory or thing she she gets very nervous about that and it's like well, i mean i think by your mid-80s you're allowed to forget things every so often otherwise 
you know, the rest of us are in a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. God bless mom if she's in her 80s and doing that well. Oh, yeah, she's doing great. She's doing yeah. great. Matter of fact, she uh, is looking to do more things with her mind, getting a little, uh, little bored, I think. So what I wanted to talk about tonight, uh, Dr. Chris, is we have not met. Uh, last time we were on the uh, air live was two weeks ago because last week was um, Memorial Day. Yeah. Okay. It was the day after we were last on the air that the uh, shootings took place in Texas and, yeah. uh, at, at the school. And um, I, I don't want to get into, before anybody reaches for the radio, we're not going to get into talking about the shooting itself so much as the conversation I had that evening with my son. My son's son, my grandson, is seven years old. Um, just wrapping up uh, first grade and uh, mm -hmm. getting ready to be promoted into the second grade. Uh, slightly younger than the age of the children that were uh, uh, killed in the shooting. So I called my son and I asked him, um, what do you say to a seven-year-old about this kind of thing? And uh, we, we had an interesting conversation. Um, so I want to throw a couple of things out uh, to you before we go to break and then come back and kind of talk about the, that a little bit. So here's a couple of notes that, that I, I, I took as I was thinking about this conversation with you tonight. So Dr. Christopher, um, one of the things that we noted is that we can't make the assumption that kids won't talk about it tomorrow at school. Uh, Correct. And he even told me that he could probably guess which kids would talk about it because he knows most of the parents and he knows which ones are probably going to be looser with it and all that. And he had a pretty good idea on where, where it would come from. And he knew that his son is very sharp, a very inquisitive young man, and um, and also very emotionally sensitive and would be bothered by this. Um, so his, he asked me, he said, so what are your words of wisdom here? And I, I told him, I got none. I, I really don't. I mean, I haven't had a little kid in the house, you know, that I'm responsible for, mm -hmm. for close to 30 years. And uh, so, and, and we didn't have this kind of thing going mm -hmm. on back then. And we didn't live in a 24 hour news cycle world where they just talk about it over and over and over and over. And um, so there were a lot of um, things that kind of went back and forth between us. Uh, he mentioned two things that I thought were, were pretty smart. Uh, one was he was going to call some of the other parents mm -hmm. and talk to them about, especially a couple of the parents that he was feeling close to, uh, talk to them about and ask them the question. How do you plan on dealing with this? And then he was going to call his teacher, the kid's teacher, uh, my, my grandson's teacher, who is a good friend of the family, a good enough friend that, you know, she shows up for his little league games and those kinds of things. So um, so he was going to give her a call and say, what's, you know, what does the school do with this? And do they address it? Not. And I thought that was a pretty good place to start. If nothing else, you know what you're swimming against. If, you know, yeah, I've got to give him a lot of credit for um, thinking outside the box and hooking up with the other parents and the teacher on that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, because and, it, and it's true, the world has changed. I mean, we didn't we didn't have to deal with this kind of thing, at least not in the same way. You could always start yeah. with that line. Back in my day, yeah, yeah, for sure. we didn't have it. You know, we couldn't afford automatic rifles. You know, yeah. the, the world the world has changed, and the news has changed. And you know, the the news um, clips are very repetitive, and um, they they'll tell you very honestly if it bleeds, it leads. That's so right. these stories are not only. Um, important for them to share but they share them at the beginning and they share them with the most emotion and they share them time and time again and the more graphic the images 
the more inclined they are to want to show them with everyone, almost proudly, like, look at the footage we have. And that's their way of, um, as someone I know used to say, selling soap. But they have to, um, <clears throat> corporate America spending a lot of money in advertisement. And the way they can get you to watch, of course, is two ways, by uh, making you frightened and by making you upset, angry, enraged. And um, they play on these emotions because people are more inclined to watch when they feel these emotions. So it's important to understand that this is a manipulation to keep you watching. And one of the things you want to do with young children is not let them watch. They need to be protected as much as possible from this. I know you're saying you want to go on a break, but if not, um, or when we get back, I want to talk about their delicate little minds and how um, we need to, we owe it to them to protect them. Yeah. And that was, uh, you know, that was the one thing we both agreed on right away is don't let him watch the coverage himself. I wish we could make a rule to tell all the other parents don't let their kids watch, but you know, a lot of parents, don't pay attention to what their kids watch at all. And it was on every channel, you know, it it wasn't like, Oh yeah. Yeah. You're right in Texas too. So I'm sure that was huge. Oh yeah. And so, yeah, it it was on NBC, CBS, ABC, the Fox channel, uh, all, of course, all the news channels, you know, so it was very easy to find. And if you don't have cable, you were really stuck with it, (laughs) you know? So uh, it, it was not, um, not a thing that you could avoid. And if the kid's sitting home alone, you know, it, it, um, so uh, the, the other question that I want to throw out there, we may not get a chance to talk about this so much, but I would be interested in your opinion. One of the channels I was watching, one of the reporters asked the question and, and, and don't give me your answer yet, because I think it's, it, it's kind of a thought question here a little bit. Are the reporters making it worse by the way they report it when it's happening? Um, He was wondering if they should be talking about it the way they were talking about it. And I thought that was very insightful for the reporter to ask the question. Of course, he was asking it of other journalists, and they were like, oh, you got to report the news. You got to do it. And that wasn't what he was saying. He was saying, are we doing this right? Uh, Because he didn't feel like we were. And I thought that was... uh, insightful on his part so if we get to that point i want to ask you about that too is um yes you're right they're doing this for a particular reason uh, but is did buffalo make uvalde happen you know is one of those questions that we'll never totally understand but um i think you have to wonder uh, and then we had uh, according to the news reports 13 mass shootings in the last 72 hours are all these yeah. things feeding it's each other? Terrific. Yeah. 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 So, so um, but I want to come back. When we come back, uh, I want to start off with talking about families and how families deal with, and it just doesn't have to be about school shootings necessarily, major news events that are shocking the world, whether that's war, shootings, terrorist attack, whatever. Uh, what are what are our responsibilities as parents and what are some of the options that we might have? So that's, that's where I want to start and uh, we'll take a quick break and check in with some health tips and so forth. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. You're listening to TNC radio dot live Tom Kelly and Dr. Christopher Cortman here with you on building strong minds. Stay tuned. This blog on TNCRadio.live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Health tips every trucker should follow. When you live your life on the road, it can be very easy to fall into an unhealthy lifestyle. This is the case when it comes to most truck drivers. Being on the road for weeks at a time can take a toll on one's health. The lack of exercise, sleep, and access to a balanced diet are all common health hazards for truckers. Taking care of your health is not only important for your well-being, it's also important for a successful career in the trucking industry. Here's some tips every trucker should take into consideration while traveling on the road. Eat healthy. Although it may be more convenient to eat fast food or grab something quick at a gas station, try stopping at a grocery store and picking up some fresh fruits and veggies. 
Some other healthy options are protein bars, dried fruits, nuts, and make sure to drink plenty of water. If your truck has an auxiliary power unit or power inverter, look into getting a portable stove, crockpot, or microwave. This will make eating healthy much easier, and it also helps save money. Be sure to be aware of your company's policies for cooking in your truck. Exercise. Finding the time to exercise can be quite a challenge when you spend 10 or more hours a day driving. Finding a little time to exercise each day can improve your physical and mental health. Walking, running, pack some running shoes and take a 30-minute walk or jog each day. It's an inexpensive option for exercising. Work out in your cabin. Setting up a workout routine to do in your cabin is a convenient way to keep yourself healthy. You don't even need workout equipment. Find time to implement these workouts in your daily routine. Push-ups, planks, sit-ups, tricep dips, stretching. Stretching can help avoid back pain. It's important for truckers to make stretching a part of their daily workout routine. Back bends, front bends, side bends, neck stretch. Sleep. Getting a good night's sleep is essential for good health. Driving can become dangerous if you're not getting an appropriate amount of sleep. Studies say that most healthy adults need between 7 and 9 hours of sleep each night. Follow these steps to a happier and healthier sleep lifestyle. Stick to a sleep schedule. Sleep on a comfortable mattress and pillow. Avoid alcohol and caffeine close to bedtime. Turn off all electronics before bed. Mind. Taking care of your mental health should be as important to your physical health. Truck driving can be boring. Keep your mind alert and fresh by listening to music while driving or tncradio.live. This blog on tncradio.live was brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Catch Landline now every night at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, along with an encore presentation weekdays at noon, right here on tncradio.live. Welcome back in TNC Radio Live. This is Building Strong Minds with Dr. Christopher Corman. I'm Tom Kelly. We're going to be here with you to the top of the hour, talking tonight about uh, dealing with our children in the midst of great tragedy. Um, and so, Dr. Chris, let me start here uh, with, with this question: At what age, roughly, is it appropriate? to start explaining to your ch- children what death really is? Well, it's a great question. And it's less about the age and it's more about their level of maturity. Uh-huh. And one of the things that um, we have to do is we have to always meet them at their level. That is, uh, we always want our information to be age appropriate. Let me give you an example that has nothing to do with um, death or tragedy, just to, to keep you uh, in this mindset. If a five-year-old child says, daddy, where do babies come from? You don't need to go into intercourse and sperm and eggs and fertilization and nine months of and labor, you just you can say um, babies come from your mommy's abdomen, your mommy's tummy, <clears throat> and then you might get oh okay, and then he goes away and he goes back to playing, and that's all he needed. But if he needs more, you can stay on that level and give them what they need. And the same thing, you know, when when we're talking about death. One of the things we want them to know, because they're going to learn it when they first see, oh, I don't know, a a bird on the ground that's dead. And, And they'll ask questions and you want them to take the lead. You don't go into a scientific lecture on, on death and the longevity of humans. You let them ask what they need to ask and you respond at the level of their maturity as to what they could handle. And um, normally that will suffice and they'll let you know if it doesn't, they'll ask more questions and, and it's really okay um, to just give them basic things that you want them to know. And you want to keep it positive and you want to keep it in line with what it is you believe as uh, as parents in that family. For instance, 
Um, if you're a person of faith, it's really okay to say that, um, you know, there's a loving God and uh, we have a life here that's generously given to us by God to live and nobody knows how long we have. But one day we're all going to die. And um, your mother and I believe that when we die, we'll go to heaven and um, we'll have another life there. Like your grandma so-and-so who's not with us anymore, but we think she's in heaven. And, you know, we can talk like that and, and make death a normal part of life, which, of course, it is. And if you don't believe any of those things, that's fine. But you still want to keep it positive and you still want to keep it with hope. <laughs> Excuse me, children need hope and they need positivity and they need to know that you're okay because when they see that you're going through something challenging, but you're okay, it gives them every confidence in the world that it's going to be okay. So even if they catch you crying and some of these things, you know, Uvalde, if that doesn't bring tears to your eyes, when you think about these, you know, 19 children, being killed in, in such a manner, um, you know, you, you wonder if you, you're too hardened and embittered by life. It, it should penetrate enough to make you feel. And so if that's the case and your children see that you have feelings like that, then you build that into their training and their learning that sometimes things are so sad and what do people do when they're sad? And you ask them, and they say, we cry. Yes. And so daddy cried because this is really sad. Sometimes it's sad to see people hurt, and it's sad to see people die, and it's sad to see. Remember when Fluffy died? You know, their guinea pig, their cat, their dog, whatever. You know, it was sad, and then I cried then because we love Fluffy. You know, and we want them to know that, we have normal human emotion and we can express that emotion appropriately. And so can they, and that it's going to be okay. Yeah. That, and I think that's, um, I, I think that the idea that it's kind of more based on their maturity, um, that, you know, cause I, I know that there are some kids who are probably eight or nine years old, who aren't as ready to hear something like that as they are when there's others who are six years old, you know, it just kind of, it depends yeah, on how they true. process things, you know? And, and so, um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And a lot of questions. So we not only let them talk and ask and have, and ask their questions, but we ask them, how did you learn about this? Right. So-and-so told me, right. Well, how did, what exactly did they say? And then they repeat it and they say, well, that's not exactly accurate. Yeah. Um, th this is true, but this part isn't. And how did you feel when you heard about this? And um, is there any part of this that really bothers you? If so, tell your daddy what that is. You know, I, I want to I wanna know. You know what bothers me as your dad? It bothers me whenever I see little kids hurt and killed. You know what I'm saying? And they say, yeah, I do. It bothers me, too. We had somebody in our class die or so. You know, you, you have an opportunity to connect and you have an opportunity to find out what's really going on in their heads. Because it's not the same as what's going on in our. They're not thinking gun control. You know, they're not thinking politics. They're not thinking the Second Amendment. You know, they're thinking about, could somebody do that to me? Is it safe to go to school where I go to school? Could that happen in our school? You know, they have, right. they have their fears, and we need to talk to them about that. But we don't have to plant fears in their heads. If they don't know anything about what happened, we leave it alone. Do schools, I honestly don't know. I, I should have asked my son about this. Um, do schools do practicing lockdowns and stuff like that with kids that young? 
You know, I think it depends on the school. It's definitely not a, uh, a universal practice like fire drills. Okay. I, I just, yeah, I, I didn't know if that was something that is common or not. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. Well, I don't want to get into the talking about it. I, I want to keep it more general than that. Let's go back to, um, okay, you, you said you've got some uh, 10, did you call them rules, a list of 10 things that we should keep in mind? Yeah, yeah. When, uh, when you mentioned it um, earlier in the afternoon, what we would be talking about tonight, I just um, wrote down 10 things that uh, – off the top of my head that I would instruct parents to consider. Great. And I, I want to jump into those then and, and uh, start looking at those. Well, I tell you what, we're let's go ahead and break now. We'll take a short break and come back and uh, I want to start asking you about those and, um, you know, seeing what, what are some of the things that uh, ring force, especially, you know, a lot of our listeners, Dr. Chris, are, drivers who are out on the road and they're not able to sit down with their their significant other or the mom or the dad and say, hey, let's have a good conversation about this before we talk to the kids. It's a lot harder to do that when you're out on the road. Oh, I'm and, sure that's true. You know, I'm so sure that's I, true. I think that's one of the things we have to keep in mind is that this is um, – <laughs> This is made much more complicated when uh, one or both parents travels a lot. So so uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Let's take a quick break. You're listening to TNC Radio Dot Live. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Cortman, and now for the Mental Health Minute. I want to share a little secret with you about what keeps humans going well into their 80s and 90s. Are you ready for this? It's the perception, it's the belief that I still matter. I still have things to do. I'm still necessary. That's number one. And number two, that I'm connected to other people. Feeling necessary and connected is important in all stages of human development. But when we become seniors, it becomes even more important because seniors in our society very often feel put out to pasture, like nobody needs me anymore. And people, according to the research, are more likely to die when they don't feel like they're necessary or connected. Here's my advice. Always find something important for you to do where you feel like you're necessary, you're needed, you're making a difference. And don't ever neglect the people in your life, the friends and the family that make life worth living. Frontlane introduces Impulse, the world's first collision alert system for the driver behind you when you have to brake hard. Impulse uses ultra-bright pulsing red LEDs to alert drivers behind you who might not be giving their full attention to the road. Using amazing accelerometer technology and a battery that will last for years, Impulse installs in minutes, fits nearly any vehicle, and never requires additional wiring. Drivers react 50% faster, helping to protect you and your passengers. Learn more by visiting www.frontlane.com slash impulse. That's www.frontlane.com slash impulse. Approved by all 50 states. Impulse by Frontlane. Welcome back, TNC Radio Live. This is Building Strong Minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman. I'm Tom Kelly, talking tonight about dealing with kids uh, in the midst of tragedy, uh, especially when we see something play out on the TV, like 9/11, uh, the school shootings in um, Uvalde. Uh, you know, all the different wild and crazy things that you can just see on the nightly news now. You don't have to switch over to HBO and see a dead teenager movie that got those just part of the 
conversation. So, Dr. Chris, you said you, you, you jotted down 10 things for us to be uh, considering um, as we talk to our children about these types of things. So uh, hit, hit me with some of them. Well, the, the first one is protect your children from the news, especially the images, the, the visual news. <clears throat> we have research that goes back to 9-11 where children were significantly more likely to suffer symptoms of post-traumatic stress if they saw those images X number of times. I don't have the exact data, but the point is there was a direct correlation between the frequency of exposure to traumatic imagery and then the symptoms of post-traumatic stress, which, you know, basically um, there's a trauma burned in your brain and your brain is trying to do two different things at the same time. One is get rid of it by bringing it up. And the other is to get rid of it by burying it. And so the, the mind is literally at war with itself trying to, um, remove a splinter as it were, but also trying to bury it because it's too ugly to think about and talk about and the feelings hurt too much. So I want to avoid them like the plague, as they say. So my first rule of thumb is um, protect the children from the news. Um, it's possible to get your news when the kids are not there. It's possible to read your news it's possible to hear your news on the radio. You know, you could do NPR or whatever your station of choice is, and you can hear things like that. You don't want them on the couch and to be surprised by these ugly and graphic images because it has the, um, the distinct possibility to traumatize the tender minds of your children. The second rule, and I alluded to this, um, already is that um, it's important to keep it age appropriate and um, steer away from <laughs> explanations that are above them or answering questions that they're not really asking. And um, they can ask some really, really tough questions. And sometimes we're caught off guard and we don't want to dodge them as much as we want to help them find something acceptable. And they'll let you know if they're, if the answer you gave is okay, because they'll give you some kind of an indication that that works for them. That's something they can run with. And so, you know, where do people go when they die? You know, you can answer that um, anyway, as long as it's honest and it's, um, promoting of the child at that particular age. So as I was saying earlier, if you're a person of faith, it's really okay to say your mom and I believe that when a person dies, they go to heaven. Not everyone believes that, but we do. And I like to believe that because I think of heaven as a place where we get to live forever and um, a place where we get to see the people who have died before us. And um, it's a happy place. And, and, you know, I like to think that those children all were promoted to heaven. You know, like some of the people in, in your school were promoted to another school or another grade. I like to think these children were promoted to heaven. You can talk like that, especially if that's your belief. Um, the third rule I, I've uh, already kind of touched on, but less is more. And, you know, let them be the ones to talk about where they are. You don't have to do lectures on it every day. You don't have to keep saying, well, how's the Baldi shooting thing today? You know, they, they might have got everything they needed in the first day when they asked the question and it was answered. We don't have to keep bringing these things up. You know, satisfy what they're asking for and, and move on. Um, the fourth rule, Tom, I, I, um, 
I believe it's a, a good thing to remind them that sometimes the people perpetuating things like this, the people who are actually doing the shooting or do bad things, because you'll get into this or they'll bring up, why do people do this? Why would somebody shoot kids, dad? Why would somebody kill these kids? Um, rather than, you know, getting into evil and, uh, you know, a world of, of darkness and, um, <clears throat> principalities and powers and, and rulers of darkness in this world. I would steer away from that with young children. And I would let them know that hurt people hurt people. In other words, that anybody who would do something like this was really hurting. And they didn't really think this through because they were in so much pain. Most of the time, people who, who hurt other people were not only hurt themselves, but lots of times they were bullied. Lots of times um, bad things happen to them and they didn't know how to, they didn't have a safe place to talk about it. They didn't know what to do with their hurt feelings. And sometimes when people don't know how to handle their hurt feelings, they end up doing things and saying things to hurt other people to kind of let them know how hurt they are. And I would keep it on that level. Yeah, that makes sense. The next one is I always want to offer them hope. I always want them to know it's going to be okay. And that, you know, these, these children are not hurting anymore. Um, I know they might have been um, scared at the time, but they're not suffering. Or that um, sometimes we have to go through tough times in our lives but we're still together. We still love each other. And I think our country is going to respond to this by doing good things. Um, maybe we can all learn good things from this. We, we want to, we want to be hopeful. And again, if you're a person of faith or even just a person who's optimistic, this is a good time to paint the, the room, so to speak with, with optimism, with, with gratitude that, you know, you're okay. And, you know, there's so many other children in the world who didn't get um, hurt that day. And and we have to be grateful for all the wonderful things we have. And, and we have to, um, it's okay to be sad for those kids and, and it's okay to cry about that. But then we want to return to, to happy again, knowing that those kids are, are, you know, they're in heaven and they're happy again. And, you know, we, we want to give them positive things and we want to ask them, can you think of things that you can feel good about even after something like this and let them come up with things. The sixth one, because they, they may ask if, um, if you do believe in a God, why would God let this happen? And that's deep. And that's really deep because it's the number one question asked by the greatest minds that have ever walked planet earth, which is if there is a God and God is all loving and all powerful, how do you explain human suffering? Well, children can ask that in a different way. Like why didn't God stop the shooter daddy? And it's, it's a really tough question, but you know, I would encourage you to um, keep it age appropriate and um, help them understand, for instance, that it seems to you that um, what you understand is that God gives us free will and he doesn't make anybody do anything. People can do whatever they want to do. And so what do you think would happen if, you took this ball and you threw it as hard as you could right at daddy's head. And the child might laugh and say, I wouldn't do that, dad. It's like, yeah, thank God you wouldn't. I'm glad you wouldn't. But what if you did? What do you think would happen? You think God would catch it and, and protect your dad? And the boy would probably say, or the girl would say, no. I think it would hit you in the head and really hurt you. It's like, yeah. That's what happens because God gives us free will. 
But then another thing I would let them know is that because God loved us, that he cries too when these things happen. That this makes God sad because we are God's children. And when God's children suffer and when God's children hurt and when God's children die, it makes God cry too. God gets sad. And he even gets sad because the person who did this was really hurting too. And he loved them too. So I would want them to understand that even if there is a loving God, that there are consequences to our behavior, that if they choose to do bad things to others, God's not going to interfere. They'll hurt other people. And they're responsible for what they choose to do. Um, One of the things, the next thing I have is, and it's an important thing, is to try to give the children some power. You know, this is one of those things that kind of takes our power away. If you talk to adults about hearing stories like this, it not only makes us sad, it not only hurts us and enrages us, one of the feelings that are so prominent is that we feel powerless, feel like we can't do anything about this. And I would want the children to know that they have some power and that there are things that they could do. And so one of the things, again, if you're a person of faith, I would have them praying and I would have them praying for all of the families and all of the friends and the teachers and the people in the school and pray for our country and pray for there to be peace in the world. You know, teach them that the Bible says that when um, good people pray, it carries a lot of weight that prayer seems to be really, really important. And, and, and Tom, if, if you don't mind on that topic of prayer, One of the most fascinating stories that um, I ever heard involved my own grandmother, who was the prayer warrior of the family. And at her funeral, the pastor talked about my grandma um, being awakened in the middle of the night, she said the next day by God, who said, start praying for so-and-so and and -and so-and-so from the church. And she didn't know why, but she prayed and prayed and prayed only to find out the next morning that these people were in a terrible car accident at that exact time. And imagine God waking up a person to pray. Like, doesn't God have the power to help them? Does he have to wake my grandma and have her pray? And it seems to me that if there's any truth to the story, and I don't know why she would ever make this up, it would seem to me that God, you know, God inhabits our prayers and, 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 and response to human prayer. So we want to teach children that that's one way that um, they could respond positively by caring about and praying for the other people. And I have a few more, and I know we need to take a yeah, break now. Yeah, let's, take, let's take a quick break and come back and, and uh, wrap this up. But this has been very helpful. And uh, it, as always, we like to put concrete things to what we're talking about. Uh, so uh, th- thank you for this list so far. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. You're listening to TNC Radio. Live. Stay right there. This blog on TNC Radio. Live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Five easy steps to help truckers stay awake while driving. Driving 11 hours a day, seven days a week can be emotionally and physically exhausting. Sleep's a very important part of a long-haul truck driver's life. Being well-rested and alert makes driving a lot more safe for both the trucker and other drivers on the road. Getting enough sleep may sound easier than it seems. Living on the road makes it difficult to get the recommended eight hours of sleep. In fact, it's common for truckers to not get eight hours of sleep due to the 11-hour work shift. To help, We've put together five tips to help truckers stay awake while driving. Take vitamins. 
One way truckers can stay awake while driving is by taking vitamins. Not only are vitamins good energy boosters, they have tons of other health benefits too. Vitamin B helps with fatigue, depression, mood boosting, and muscle weakness. Consider adding vitamins to your morning routine. Eat healthy. An unhealthy diet has a huge impact on one's overall health. Jennifer Sechak, PhD now, says, Our bodies rely on the energy and nutrients we get from food. So what you eat, and how and when you eat it, can either drain you or sustain you. It might be more convenient to stop at a fast food restaurant or truck stop, but constantly eating junk food drains your energy. Check out our blog on quick and healthy meals for truckers for healthy food ideas. Take a nap. Before you hit the road, consider taking a short 20-minute nap. Several studies have shown that a quick nap immediately increases alertness and gives a boost in cognitive performance. Stay hydrated. Water has many health benefits. One benefit is reducing the chance of being fatigued. Drinking a pint of cold water is a great way to refresh yourself and stay more alert. Listen to upbeat music. Listening to upbeat music will have you tapping your foot, singing along, and staying alert in no time. Avoid listening to relaxing music or audiobooks. These tend to make drivers more relaxed and sleepy. Truckers have a very demanding job. In order to deal with the stress and demand, it's very important to get the right amount of sleep. Hopefully, these five tips will help truckers stay awake while driving. This blog has been brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.com. What do you know about trains? Whether you're an expert or just want to learn something about the world of the railroad, join Bill and Jim Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central on TNCRadio.live. Welcome back in TNCRadio.live, Building Strong Minds with Dr. Christopher Cortman. I'm Tom Kelly. Um, so, Dr. Cortman, we've been going through a list of uh, concrete things for us to be considering in dealing with our children in the midst of, of tragedy. Before we continue on with that list, uh, let's remind people, if they want to get hold of you or look at some of your books and so forth, first of all, uh, would you point, is there a particular book that you've written that would be helpful to people in this discussion? Uh, and uh, how can people... Uh, learn more about you and what you do. Okay, srqshrink.com is a good way to find me and <clears throat> pretty much everything or anything I've done. Um, of, of my books, um, the one that would be most relevant is a, a book called Keep Pain in the Past that I co-wrote with uh, Dr. Joe Walden, who is a psychologist that did a lot of work with the VA um, but that's a book about getting over the worst thing that ever happened to you. Um, and it's, you know, it's written for adults and there's a lot of tragic stories in it, but the reason to tell those stories is to essentially say, these people went through this and they healed and they're doing quite well. Chances are, you're not going to go through anything that horrible, but if they can get help, so can you. And, um, you know, we're talking tonight about children, and um, there's all kinds of books that you can share with your children. You know, lots of adults would say, I don't know what to say, but um, there are great books that all you have to do is sit down and share these books or read the books. And one of the things that that does is that it, it bonds you even closer to your child. Even if you're reading a silly comedy book, it bonds you with your child, but it's all the better when you're helping them deal with things like this. So, you know, if you have a little one, there's a book called The Sad Dragon, um, a dragon book about grief and loss. It's a, you know, it's a story. It's a cute story to help the kids. There's also books for older kids, like 8 to 12, you know, like there's a journal, how I feel journal, a grief journal for kids. I really like that because they end up having a chance to express what it's like to be them. Oh yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, you want to encourage things like that. There's a book called uh, always in your heart 
um, a picture book on coping from grief and loss. There's, there's just, there's a lot in today's world. Good. I mean, no parent has an excuse of, I don't know what to say because there's so much, there's so much information and all one has to do is order one of these books or borrow one from a library and uh, sit down with the kids and, and use it as a good bonding time. Sure. Sure. Well, yeah. you know, I was talking before about empowering, uh, excuse me, Tom. Um, but I was, I was thinking, you know, we can teach them to pray for instance, but there are things that they might want to do um, in addition to prayer and empowering them sometimes is about saying, what do you want to do to, uh, to try to help? And the kids can sometimes think of things by themselves. And if not, you can say, well, how do you feel about drawing something or making something? And I'll send it to the, um, the Uvalde school. I'll send it to them from you. You just, or you could write a letter to the kids in the school that says, um, you know, I'm praying for you and I want you to know that I'm sad. And, you know, you know, I just wanted to send you something nice. So I picked some flowers or, you know, you could, you could be creative or sometimes kids want to do more than that. They want to get up and they want to say, this was not acceptable. We need to do something in this country to stop this. Or maybe they can write a letter to their congressman. And, you know, at whatever age, they can write it in crayon. They, you know, you could, you could allow them to express what it, is, what it is they want to say and empower them. Because sometimes out of the mouth of babes comes things that congressmen read. <laughs> in front of all the others. I got this from an eight-year-old and I want everybody to hear it. And then you see all these wet eyes because this is a child expressing it. Um, the ninth thing I wanted to say is um, teach them, use this as an opportunity to teach them about kindness and helping others. And again, sometimes these people who do things like this are so hurt. This is a good opportunity to, to teach kindness because people, when they're happy, you know, a psychologist named uh, Sid Simon once said, when people have good esteem, when they feel good about themselves, two things are true. Number one is they don't hurt themselves. And number two is they don't hurt other people. So we want them to, you know, people who are hurting others, bullies, for instance, are trying to tell you something. They're trying to tell you I'm not happy with me. Because when I'm happy with me, I don't look to hurt others. I look to help others. So we want to use this as another learning opportunity to be kind, to make a difference. Because you don't even know that by helping one person, how much that makes that person's life better. Or by hurting one person, something like this could happen. You know, because you made fun of somebody, because you teased them, because you hurt them. Who knows what they're going to do to hurt other people later? How about we turn that around and say, because you love them, because you were kind to them, because you stood up for them, because you went and sat with them because nobody else did. You know, what kind of a difference would you be making in their lives? And the final thing that I have on my list is to teach them that when they hurt, there are appropriate ways to express that, that the shooter, for instance, didn't know and didn't have. And you can have them help you come up with a list, a whole list of things that they could do when they're sad or when they're hurt. You know, Tom, I have a young, I have young kids for a guy my age. My son is 10 and he was in his room last week and he was talking about something um, that bothered him. And he said about his sister, he said, she really hurt my feelings. And he was crying. And there was a part of me that reverted back to my childhood. If, if someone ever said that I would mock them or make fun of them, we don't say that you hurt your feelings. Oh, poor baby. And I thought, isn't that horrible that that's how I learned. But now as a psychologist and a dad, I know better. Yeah. And I said, I'm so sorry. Tell me. 
what happened and what hurt you know i i and then in no time at all he was better because he had a chance to appropriately express his feelings i hate to cut this off but we are at the top of the hour and the next show is going to start up whether we want it to or not so uh this has been a great conversation conversation i've 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 conversation